In order to move forward, we're actually going to have to take a little bit of a detour from our enolate chemistry and consider the concept of conjugate addition, which is found in chapter 22 in your textbook, the, the Claydon uh, textbook. So conjugate addition um, can best be explained this way. We'll start with a, a simple compound, which is an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. Now you should know that if we take that alpha-beta unsaturated ketone and we react it with a Grignard reagent, such as methyl magnesium bromide, we know that the methyl group is a nucleophile. Uh, it's effectively got a negative charge on it. And we should know that we can kind of draw a mechanism that looks like that. And the product of this reaction would be this over here. A new methyl group is added on, and we have an O minus. And of course, in workup, so normally the first step will be doing this, and the second step will have some sort of proton source coming from an acid uh, or from water, uh, and that would protonate this, giving us the, the, the OH. All right, so that's the Grignard reaction, which you should know from, from first year. How if we do this exactly the same reaction as we have above here, but we add just a very small amount, a catalytic amount of copper chloride. So the first step is exactly the same. We've just now added some copper chloride. We get a different product. The product now looks like this. The ketone is still there, but we have a methyl group over there. So this methyl group from the Grignard reagent because we've now added copper, suddenly goes to this position um, over here uh, on this molecule and not the uh, uh, carbonyl. This second step is called conjugate addition. It has a couple of other names. Uh, the first other name is known as a 1,4 addition. Uh, and that comes from the, uh, uh, the, the reason is that we are adding to, uh, as we add this uh, nucleophile, it's adding to this position over here, we're going one, two, three, and the negative charge ends up on the oxygen over there. It's one, four addition. The Grignard reaction is also actually just known as a one, two addition. Uh, and that one is because when we add, over, add it to this carbon over here, the charge ends up on the oxygen, one, two, and that's how it comes along. Uh, there's another name for this, and that is that these 1-4 additions are also trivially known as Michael additions. Uh, and you'll hear that term being mentioned a few times as well. Right, the more general term is a conjugate addition. Okay, so what has actually happened over here? Well, um, the nucleophile, just from a mechanistic point of view, what's happened is the nucleophile has now come in and attacked this position over there, double bond has shifted, and the electrons have ended up on the oxygen over there. So we have this intermediate, which looks like this, all right? You should be able to draw that out now. And this is just an enolate, so second step, when we're working it up with water, in acid, etc., then this enolate is going to collapse, pick up a proton like so, and give us our product over there. So this is the first time that, the first point I want to make at least here is that what's happening here is we're actually having, in a conjugate addition, we're getting the formation of an enolate, and you need to keep that in mind for, uh, for, for, for future reference. When we first introduced you to Grignard reactions back in first year, we said that a carbonyl group could actually be drawn out uh, in a resonance form. If we break this pi bond, we could move the electrons onto the oxygen and we could draw out a resonance form of it, which looks like uh, this, O minus, and of course a plus over there. Let's not get that double bond. We said that this is one way of thinking about a carbonyl group, and it explains why the carbon of a carbonyl is the electrophile in reactions. Okay, so 
We explain it that way, and this was a good way of thinking. We sometimes said that the oxygen is delta negative, and this is delta positive over here. Um, but in the same way, the same concept that we have here is that if we draw this resonance uh, um, uh, system over here, in the same way, we can actually take this double bond and shift it across, and we would then get another resonance structure, which looks like this, minus plus there, and like that. All right, and we get that structure over here. Now remember, these are just this is just a an explanation. This is not happening in the molecule. This is not something that we can isolate and see. It's just an explanation to to show that this carbon over here actually has a bit of a positive charge on it. This carbon also has a bit of a positive charge, all right? But this one also uh, as well. So there are two places that have slight positive charges on them, and therefore two places that can undergo nucleophilic attack. They are slightly ele electronegative, uh, electrophilic, sorry, slightly electrophilic, and therefore we can get a nucleophilic attack occurring at that carbon. For yourself, you need to go back and look at just something quite um, fundamental. If you can't ans answer this, then I'm going to pose to you now. Uh, you'll find the answer in your textbook, but just you should be asking yourself, or at least be able to answer this question. I've drawn this kind of resonance structure that's happened. Why can't we do the same thing by pushing electrons in like this and ending up with the electrons of the carbon over there? In other words, making that carbon the nucleophile uh, in that. And you should go and look in your textbook to, to understand that. This one is exemplified by something known as cyanohydrin formation. So uh, if I just draw out this conjugated system uh, over here, it's just a very simple one. Uh, and we had to do a reaction of this with um, sodium cyanide, with uh, hydrogen cyanide, uh, and we do this at a fairly low, low temperature, say about 10 degrees. Now, uh, if we don't do this reaction very carefully, um, our friends are going to find us uh, dead on the floor because this is highly toxic. So we'd be working in a fume cupboard if we were wanting to, to do something like this. But assuming that we got this right and we managed to do this, uh, we recognize that the nitrile is a, a nucleophile and this reaction would prefer to add to the carbonyl of the ketone. And so the product we would get is... Um, Cn, O minus, and of course we've got acid present over there, so this will then just become OH. The thing is, is that cyanohydrins are actually an irrever uh, sorry, a reversible reaction, and so as much as we can form them, they can actually go back as well. But if the unsaturated reaction occurs, so if, however, the nitrile does a reaction a Michael reaction or a conjugate addition or a 1,4 addition to this position over here, we then get the electrons moving across. The same thing happens over, over there. Uh, and the product we get is this one, which of course, again, is the, the, the enolate, is the first intermediate in this 1,4 addition. The enolate is now in the presence of acid, and so this can... Uh, rush over, pick up a proton, and we get uh, the addition product like this, the one for addition product. This, however, is a far more stable molecule than this one over here. Uh, and so very slowly you can form this compound uh, in preference to this one. This is actually promoted by raising the temperature of the reaction. And this brings us to a concept which is important, and we're going to revisit this uh, in the context of enolate chemistry later on, of uh, kinetic and thermodynamic uh, products. And at this stage, it's important uh, dynamic. At this stage, uh, it's important for us to just understand how these terms arise. Kinetic products are products that form very quickly. They happen first. Uh, the product doesn't necessarily have to be the most stable one, but it's the one that is formed more quickly. And typically, kinetic products are formed at low temperatures. We will revisit these concepts again, but I just want to uh, 
uh, start now with it. Thermodynamic compounds or products at least are the ones which are tend to be more stable and tend to be achieved at, at higher temperatures. So one thing that controls whether we have a conjugate addition or not can be the conditions of the reaction. So thermodynamic conditions tend to favor the conjugate addition, whereas kinetic conditions, colder temperatures, can favor the 1-2 addition that we have seen already. This can be exemplified by looking at, uh, for instance, this reaction over here. If we to take uh, this unsaturated aldehyde and react it with butyl lithium, which is actually a really, really strong base, and we don't often think of it as being a nucleophile, but in this case there's no, no easy proton for it to remove. So the alkyl lithium will attack this aldehyde, which is very reactive. Aldehydes are incredibly reactive. And so we're going to get this sort of reaction occurring over here. So we end up with an O minus, and the butyl group will be sitting over there, four carbons going along. And of course, we can protonate this at the end by adding uh, water. However, if we did using the same reagent, but now our starting material is slightly different, it's not an aldehyde anymore, but it is a amide, all right, dimethyl amide. This center over here is no longer very electrophilic at all. And so if we had to react this with uh, butyl lithium, again, negative charge of the butyl lithium acts as a nucleophile, and now it does a 1,4 addition uh, product reaction at least. And we end up with this enolate type compound, Me2, butyl has gone here, and we end up with that. And once again, we've got this enolate intermediate, which can collapse once we do the reaction workup and we add some acid. And it goes back to, not the ketone, but the, the amide. So structural features are important as well in this. The more reactive the carbonyl group, the more likely you get a 1-2 addition. The, le the, the more less reactive, I'll use those terms, then we're going to get the 1-4 addition. So amides and esters are less reactive than uh, your ketone and your, your aldehyde. We want to know whether a nucleophile is either hard or, or soft. And this has to do with whether a nucleophile has a lot of charge on it or whether the nucleophile is governed by the orbitals in terms of its reaction. That's, that's a simplistic way of looking at these, these two concepts. Now, you should have covered this in inorganic chemistry. Um, but for our purposes, just to try and simplify things a little bit here, uh, let's just um, draw out our unsaturated system. If we had to take something like this, our hard nucleophiles are the ones that are going to do the 1-2 additions over there. Our soft nucleophiles are the ones that are going to do 1-4 types of additions. Uh, and this is not, whether a molecule is hard and soft, is not necessarily true in, uh, for, it's not easy to actually categorize every single nucleophile that you can have. And so I'm just going to lay out some common ones which are very obviously either hard or soft. But you need to understand that nucleophiles can sit uh, in a range in between. And, and then other factors are going to come into place whether we do a 1-2 or 1-4 addition. So for hard nucleophiles, the ones which um, I think are important for you to uh, be aware of are Grignard reagents. So all your Grignard reagents, magnesium bromide, so R magnesium bromide, or could be magnesium iodide, Grignard reagents are seen as hard and prefer to do 1-2 additions. Uh, your alkyl lithiums, are also hard. Um, that negative charge is sitting right on top of the carbons in both of these and it's it's very unstable and so it needs to react um, quite uh, energetically and it will want to go into an 1-2 position over there. This is the, the hard 
electrophile uh, position over there. Uh, another one that might want to do this is something like an O minus, an alkoxide. Uh, this is also this negative charge sitting on top of the oxygen. It's got nowhere else to go. It's, it's unstable in that position and it is a hard nucleophile. Uh, so uh, examples of soft nucleophiles. Well, if we take both of those and add a copper metal to it, the copper actually gets to spread the charge around a little bit more. And so Gilman reagents, which are the copper-based reagents, and they'll look like this. So we can take this and we add the copper, just as I did it in the beginning of this, this lecture. Um, and what we actually form is this organocuprate uh, interme intermediates, negative and plus over there. And these are like the Grignard reaction reagents that are, can now act as a nucleophile, and a bit, but it will prefer to add in a 1 4 addition over there. And both of these um, intermediates can work by just adding a little bit of copper, one salt to, to the reaction. Uh, and then, just as a comparison to this, the salt uh, thiols or thiolates. Uh, S minus, uh, it's just below oxygen, all right, the same sort of reactivity, but actually the sulfur is way bigger um, and that negative charge is spread around the sulfur and it, these are fantastic um, soft nucleophiles and will very definitely add to the 1,4 position over there. And then lastly, just because this is the chemistry that we are doing, after all, um, the, the most important thing for us now is that enolates are good, soft nucleophiles and this carbon over here will rapidly add in a conjugate type addition which we will cover um, uh, shortly and will react to form do these types of of reactions on a on a conjugated system uh, my, micro reactions and that basically summarizes conjugate addition